Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Sunday the 8th of May. And we're going to notice that cases and hospitalizations are for the most part going down. But surprisingly, long COVID seems to be more common with Omicron uh, BA2. So let's get a bit of an update about the data now. Mostly, as I said, encouraging. So here's a bit of a contextualization screen. Now, we know that the cases are a rather crude proxy of infections, but we do see uh, clear blue water between Australia and New Zealand and the other countries that we're following here in terms of number of uh, number of cases, officially diagnosed infections. Now, hospital patients, um, yeah, well, what do we see? Well, Netherlands come down. That's the Netherlands line there. This is South Africa. The United States has got a slight uptick in hospitalizations, I'm afraid. Now, this isn't entirely surprising because of the um, the, the BA2 wave that's now uh, currently sweeping across the United States, has been for some time really, and the subvariants of BA2. So it's not surprising there is a small increase in hospitalizations as we see, much smaller than I had feared, indeed smaller than I had predicted, I'm delighted to say. The hospitalizations in other countries we see there, the United Kingdom going down quite nicely, but Canada um, currently the highest, uh, unfortunately. This is the number of patients in intensive care. Now, the reason I put this up is since we went into the Omicron era, uh, this has only gone down everywhere. So a constant trend of decreasing patients in intensive care everywhere which, of course, is, is uh, good news. There's no question now that the Omicron is less severe than the Delta variant. Cumulative COVID-19 deaths per million. Now, these are the deaths that are attributed to COVID-19. Um, now, United States, we see, is the highest than the United Kingdom. Uh, South Africa, with a much lower vaccination rate, but still pretty high death rates. Ireland, Netherlands, both good vaccination rates, lower death rates. Canada, Australia and New Zealand, unfortunately, we do see are now starting to uh, increase in terms of the amounts of death. But compared to the amount of infections they've got, um, it's, it's less than we could have feared. And these are excess mortality data here, which uh, as we've looked at this quite a few times and um, the, probably the best way to measure deaths is the excess mortality. It's the direct and the indirect deaths, as we noticed recently. And here we see that South Africa is highest for this. And then the United States. Uh, these are percentages now of excess deaths. The United Kingdom, Netherlands, Ireland, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. So let's look now at the uh, COVID symptom tracker data from the UK, now, now called the Zoe Health Study because it's broadened out now. But let's have a quick look at that. Now, the number of new cases per day has certainly gone down quite dramatically and it's gone down consistently, which is the trend we've been seeing. In terms of um, incidents by age group, again, all age groups are going down including quite dramatically the older, more at-risk age group. That purple line there is the over 75-year-old age group, which, of course, are most at risk of hospitalisation. Uh, likewise, we see a decrease in incidence in uh, all ages, prevalence and incidence in all age groups in the UK. Again, quite a satisfying reduction. And this is the latest graphic here from the, uh, from the site, and again, we see this consistent reduction in number of uh, new infections. So that's altogether really quite encouraging. Now, just to review some of the main points, the, remember these, of course, are symptomatic cases. Do check out the links for yourself. Plenty of data available. So basically, symptomatic cases down 27% on the week. Uh, now, the government figures are actually 10 times lower than this. So the government figures are currently missing about 90% of infections. So why they bother still publishing that official data is, is hard to say now. The UK R value 0.8, pretty well similar across the home countries. Wales and Scotland slightly higher. They, these do tend to just fluctuate week by week. I don't think we can read too much into it really. It's just random fluctuation that we that we see. Uh, one in 27 people in the UK currently symptomatic, so still pretty pretty common. Now, um, BA1 and uh, BA2 symptoms. 
The consensus from Tim Spector here, although the data is not firm yet, but BA2 probably generates more mild symptoms, so more symptoms but milder, and BA2 is of lower severity at the time. But as we will see, it's looking like BA2 might be causing more um, BA2 might be causing more cases of long COVID. Now let's move on to some Office for National Statistics data now. So here we see the percentage testing positive in England and we've got this continuous decline and I do expect that to continue. That's the data for Scotland which is showing a similar very encouraging decline especially as we come into the better weather. Now this is cumulative percentage of the population who've tested positive over the, uh, the, the screening study that's been carried out with the Office for National Statistics. And this shows in England, for example, that 70% of the population have actually had the infection. Now, it's important to stress that this is not, this is not an antibody study. This is an antigen study. This is testing for the presence of the virus over a period of time by retesting a, a group of individuals, over half a million individuals, in fact. So there we see that's about 70% of the population have actually tested positive at some time as of um, a couple of weeks ago, about 10 days ago, when this data was collected. Pity we still don't have any antibody study on that from the Office of National Statistics, but more on that in a minute. Now, here we have the, um, this, this is the percentage testing positive in different age groups. And again, we see it going down across the demographics. Particularly useful to notice the decline in incidence in the older age group, as we know that they are most at risk of hospitalisation. Now, this is a concern here, the increase in uh, long COVID. Um, now, it's really hard for people to avoid this infection now. So the risk of long COVID is really there for everyone. This is the problem. So, But here we see 1.8 million people in the UK are experiencing self-reported long COVID as of the 3rd of April. Now, OK, it's well over a month out of date now, but um, we do see very high levels of reporting and going up during the Omicron period, which is disappointing. Now, this is showing the percentage of people complaining of long COVID after Delta infection and after Omicron BA1 infection. Now, the people with the Delta infection were doubly vaccinated and the people with the Omicron infection were doubly vaccinated. And we see that, what, about eight and three quarter percent of people after uh, BA1 were complaining of long COVID, but it much higher after Delta. So we can clearly see there that more people were developing long COVID after Delta infection compared to Omicron BA1 infection with the same people with the same vaccination status. Now, this is people that were triply vaccinated. And what this does is compares the incidence of long COVID here after Delta and after Omicron BA1 in people that are triply vaccinated. And we see the percentages there for Omicron BA1 fairly similar, around about 8%. So not looking like a lot of protection is afforded against long COVID by a third injection there. And this is fine. This, these groups are good comparisons because they're comparing light with light, triply vaccinated versus triply vaccinated. Uh, Delta, Delta compared with BA2. So again, we actually see here. Now, this was kind of expected. We would expect uh, more long COVID after Delta. But here we see that BA2, actually more people complaining of long COVID after BA2 compared to Delta. And when we compare BA1 with BA2, again, we see more people complaining of long COVID after BA2. Um, now, this is a surprise. We'll need more data to know if this is a, a definitive trend. But um, it is looking like this is, a, this is a trend that there's more people complaining of long COVID after, after BA2 uh, infection. Now, in terms of symptoms, um, so... These are just the, uh, the the types of symptoms that people are complaining of with the uh, from the Office of National Statistics survey. So the percentages: loss of taste, loss of smell, loss of taste, loss of smell. Fewer people complaining of those. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, fatigue, headache, muscle ache, myalgia, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, 
and asymptomatic round about 30, 32, 33 percent at the present time. Now this is hospital admissions and um, the news continues to get better on hospital admissions. So here we see really quite a good reduction. Overall hospital admissions involving COVID-19 decreased and uh, HDU and uh, high dependency unit and intensive care admissions, the faint blue line along the bottom remain very low. But this is encouraging because this has been high a couple of times in this, in this, um, on these what we can now call the Omicron waves, particularly BA1 there and particularly BA2 there. In terms of people actually getting infections, we see a variety across the age groups. More older people have been infected lately, but hospital admissions and deaths clearly highly skewed towards the older age groups, as, as we've always seen. Uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID positive admissions decreased in all age groups. So uh, 0 to 4, 5 to 14, 15 to 24 year old age group maintained in the, uh, the middle aged uh, age, age groups and also in the older age groups. So this is good to see because uh, this, of course, is the group most at uh, most at risk, of course. Now, this is the uh, death rate. Now, the death rate is very stark death rates in the previous waves, of course. But the, the death rate is going up slightly. Now, this is due to the large amount of infections that we've had over the past um, month, well, over the Omicron wave, really. The very, very large numbers of people being infected. So uh, although the percentage of deaths is much less, the overall number, sadly, is is higher at the moment. I would expect this to start going down really quite quickly. Now this is the this is the deaths uh, this is the deaths with COVID or from COVID debate of course. Now this line these lines here show that uh, COVID was a major factor in the death. So that's what is that about 60% now but of course this means that this 40% or so of people died with COVID not from COVID. So we still see more people dying from COVID than with COVID, but the proportion of people dying with COVID is increasing because there's been such high levels of COVID around at the time when this survey was uh, conducted. Now there's been a bit of a change here in the reporting of uh, de deaths and comorbidities. So the proportion of COVID-19 deaths with no pre-existing conditions decreased, um, but we do see here Signs and symptoms are an ill-defined condition. Now, that's not a very satisfying category. I guess it just means others. Uh, because for a long time, they did put diabetes at the top. But now dementia and Alzheimer's disease uh, as, as a underlying risk factor for death is increased quite dramatically. And chronic lower respiratory disease now seems a, a more common uh, terminal comorbidity than diabetes. Urinary system, ischemic heart disease, hypertensive disease, cardiac arrhythmias and heart failure arrhythmias, cerebrovascular disease, disease involving the brain and uh, people with no pre-existing conditions down there to around about what 13 or 14% or of deaths. Now this graphic is showing um, deaths within six weeks of vaccination in people aged 12 to 29 years and this is what you would expect with no intervention so we noticed that there's basically no change in the first one to six weeks slightly fewer deaths um, we one two three four five six so slightly more deaths in weeks four and six but basically the numbers here are so small i don't think this is really statistically significant now, what this graphic shows is that sadly the suicide rates in men in light blue are higher than the um, suicide rates in the very dark blue here. Um, the average for males and females is this line here. Now, this is only going up to December 2020, which was the first year of the pandemic, really. Um, but numbers of suicides have not increased. 
Whether that remains true for 2021, of course, we don't know yet. Now, here's a new graphic that they've started presenting. Now, it's a bit complicated to look at to begin with, but let's look at the, the English one. Now, what this is showing is this is the percentage of the population uh, with uh, levels of antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2 below the 179 nanograms per mil. In other words, these have got low levels of antibodies. These people have got medium levels of antibodies, but these people have got higher levels of antibodies above 800 nanograms of antibody per mil. So what this is showing is time go, as time has gone on, we've got more people with very high proportions of antibodies in the blood up to April the 11th. Now, given that the vaccination rate during this time has not been particularly high, it really seems to me that this large increase in the high amounts of antibodies is due to people being infected and reinfected. So really quite high levels of antibodies in the blood. And we actually notice here that this is 100% because essentially 100%, about 99% of people have got antibodies of some sort, but an increasing amount with the higher amounts of antibodies. And I attribute, I attribute this increased amount here to the uh, Omicron wave. If I'm wrong about that, I will let you know, but that's the way I interpret that at the moment. Now let's just finish off with a few points uh, on, on paper I wanted to highlight. Um, this is actually from the, the Tim Spector's comment here that I forgot to mention before. Uh, he said XC, that's the combination of the BA1 and the BA2. Not currently a big concern, but they are keeping an eye on it. So um, this, is the, this is the percentage tested positive. Uh, again, the antigen study, not the antibody study. Over half a million people. Uh, from the 27th of April 2020 to the 11th of February 2022, at least in England, 70% uh, of the population, 70.7 .7 tested uh, positive at some point during that time. If we'd tested the whole population, this is based on this figure of over half a million, which of course is a highly representative sample. Wales, it was less. Northern Ireland, it was a little bit higher. Scotland, it was a little bit lower. But the data was collected later in Wales and, uh, and Scotland. So basically for the UK, we can say that just over 70% of people have actually had uh, the infection. And of course, that, that's, that, that's only going to go up, isn't it? That's only going to go incre increase because as we've seen, prevalence is still relatively high, going down, but relatively high. Risk of reinfection, 10 times higher with Omicron period compared to the Delta period, as we've noticed. So 10 times more likely. This is the immune escape associated with Omicron. Risk of death involving Omicron variants is 67% lower uh, than with the, uh, the Delta variant. Now, self-reported long COVID, just to emphasize this, 1.8 million people. 1.8 million people, 2.8% of the population of the UK complaining of some form of long COVID as of the 3rd of April. 73% uh, symptoms for at least 12 weeks. That's 73% of this 1.8 million people, which is 2.8% of the population. 44% uh, for at least a year. Very concerning that some people have had long COVID features for over a year. In fact, that's 44%. So that, that's, that, that's about over 700,000 people have had long COVID for at least a year. Main features, uh, fatigue is the most common. Shortness of breath, uh, loss of smell, difficulty concentrating. And symptoms adversely affect the day-to-day -day activities of 67% of this 1.8 million uh, people. And uh, in doubly vaccinated people, self-reported long COVID was almost twice as common after Delta uh, than uh, after Omicron BA1 infections. But we did notice that there was more long COVID after BA2 compared to BA1. But I think I'll leave us today with this screen here that I really consider to be quite encouraging. These are the people with the highest levels of antibodies and there are more people with higher levels of antibodies generating more overall immunity, which I believe is the reason that the infections are going down in such a satisfying way. Um, more on the United States and other places, to, things to look at later in the week. But, but for now, um, thank you for watching.